Good afternoon, and thank all of you for being here again. Uh, today, you may have seen it, but we announced that FEMA has approved three additional parishes for individual assistance, and those parishes are Acadia, Washita, and Vermilion. Uh, so this brings the total number of parishes approved uh, for individual assistance to nine. As you will recall, our request includes an additional 14 parishes, um, and obviously that remains pending uh, with FEMA. And as we get additional damage information, uh, we are reporting uh, that information uh, to FEMA. And they're, they're here on the ground in, in considerable numbers and, and uh, looking at the damage themselves as well. So if you suffered damage in Hurricane Laura and live in one of the nine parishes that have been approved by FEMA for individual assistance, please register for FEMA assistance as soon as you can. Even if you're not sure whether you qualify, it's important that you register. To those who are in the 14 parishes awaiting FEMA approval, please know that we continue to advocate for you and pass along information just as quickly as we're able. So those who sustain losses in Hurricane Laura in these parishes, you're eligible for individual assistance and you certainly should apply with FEMA. They are Acadia, Allen, Beauregard, Calcasieu, Cameron, Jefferson Davis, Washita, Vermilion, and Vernon. You can apply for assistance today. You do that by registering online at disasterassistance.gov or you can call 1-800-621-FEMA. That's 1-800-621-3362. Part of the registration process uh, will determine whether you qualify for critical needs assistance. Uh, this is assistance that has been approved for eligible uh, survivors. Uh, and it's available for those who have immediate or critical needs because they are displaced from their primary dwelling. Um, and again, they may be eligible for additional assistance that includes a one-time $500 payment per household. The eligibility criteria for critical needs include that you have a complete registration with FEMA, the applicant passes identity verification, uh, at registration, the applicant asserts that he or she has critical needs and requests financial assistance for those needs and expenses. Their pre-disaster primary residence is in a parish designated for critical needs assistance. And that the applicant is displaced from their pre-disaster primary residence as a result of the disaster. Now, those questions are asked when you register for disasterassistance.gov. So if you just complete all the questions that you're given, uh, they will determine whether you meet the eligibility criteria. Again, that's in the same nine parishes approved for individual assistance that I went through in just a moment ago. Also approved in those same nine parishes is disaster unemployment assistance for eligible individuals. And those applications are now be taken, uh, being uh, taken, again, in those same nine parishes. Uh, the process began yesterday, uh, and the deadlines for applying will depend on the date that the parish was actually approved for individual assistance. But the deadline is 30 days from the declaration for each parish. Disaster unemployment assistance is available for workers and self-employed individuals who are not eligible for regular unemployment insurance programs, and they have to be unemployed as a direct result of the disaster, but not eligible for state benefits. Uh, disaster unemployment assistance is 100% federally funded. The amount is $108 per week. Individuals filing for disaster unemployment assistance are required to provide proof of employment and wages within 21 days of their application. And for more information, please contact the Louisiana Workforce Commission at 866-783-5567. I also want to remind those impacted who need shelter to text LA Shelter to 898211. 
for information about where to go. Um, the reception center, uh, as we announced yesterday, is now in Alexandria at the mega shelter. Uh, as of noon today, there were 11,106 individuals being sheltered in the state of Louisiana. The vast majority of these are being sheltered in non-congregant shelters. That's 10,683 individuals in non-congregant shelters. These are hotels in the New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Shreveport areas. The vast majority of these are in New Orleans. Those impacted by Laura can register for disaster SNAP benefits now and be ready if DSNAP becomes available for their particular community. You do that by going to dcfs.la.gov slash DSNAP. Um, DSNAP is available uh, for those individuals in parishes that are declared as uh, eligible for individual assistance. So it's those, as of now, it's still those nine parishes that we mentioned earlier. The targeted date for starting DSNAP is September the 10th. Uh, I do want to remind everyone that DCFS has updated its system, so if at some point previously you pre-registered for DSNAP, uh, that pre-registration is no longer effective, and so you have to pre-register again. If you are on SNAP currently, you don't need to pre-register. Uh, you're already in the system, but, but if you're not a current SNAP beneficiary, you do need to, to register. And for those individuals who are already on SNAP, if you're entitled to replacement benefits because of the power outage in your area, know that we are working on that. Uh, you don't have to do anything right now. Um, and, and then finally, as mentioned uh, previously, uh, this month all SNAP recipients will again receive the maximum benefit for their household size. DCFS has set up a connect line for Laura, I'm sorry, for Hurricane Laura. So families who are trying to reach loved ones in a non-congregate shelter can call the connect line or they can go online and fill out a form. Uh, please note for safety and security reasons, DCFS will not confirm whether an individual is at a shelter, but if you leave your information and that individual happens to be there, they will pass it along so they can call you back. Uh, the number, that you reach on the connect line or that you should, should call for the connect line is 225-342-2727. Or you can go online and complete the form at www.dcfs.la.gov slash connect. An update on the National Guard activities. Uh, Louisiana National Guard currently has more than 6,100 soldiers just responding to the disaster. Uh, they have cleared more than 1,400 miles of highway and roadways. They've assessed an additional 1,500 miles, and thus far they have distributed more than 1.2 million MREs, 1.8 million liters of water, and 25,000 tarps. And currently they're doing this at 31 points of distribution and nine hubs, so a total of 40 sites in 20 parishes. Uh, and this is where they're distributing the MREs, the water, tarps, and ice, and so forth. Uh, the Highway Department, Department of Transportation Development, debris pickup uh, page is scheduled to be updated uh, on 511LA.org every night from 8 to 10 p.m. So if you want to know about debris pickup in your area, uh, when your highway uh, may be cleared of, of debris, uh, take, take a look at 511LA.org. That'll be updated every night from 8 to 10. I also continue to encourage people to go to the same site, 511LA.org, for real-time information on road closures. Uh, with respect to the COVID pandemic, today we are reporting 667 new COVID cases on 17,036 tests. Sadly, we are reporting 34 new deaths
for a total of 400, I'm sorry, 4,821. We have 910 hospitalized patients across the state with COVID. Uh, that's an increase for, of 29 from yesterday. Of the 910 uh, hospitalized, 120 are on ventilators, and that's down four from yesterday. Uh, we have some positive news yesterday on the White House Coronavirus Task Force. Um, we had a call, and it was announced that um, there are going to be antigen, new antigen tests coming online. These are uh, sophisticated tests that don't require electricity or, or off-site laboratories to perform them. Uh, immediately after the call, I spoke with Admiral Girard uh, on the task force. Uh, and he committed the first 50,000 of those tests uh, to come to Louisiana to help us to administer these tests to individuals uh, who may be in shelters or we might want to use them at our points of distribution uh, or otherwise in helping us to respond to uh, both the COVID pandemic and the uh, Hurricane Laura uh, response that, that, we're, that we're currently undergoing. Uh, I do want to thank Lane, uh, the Louisiana uh, uh, National Guard. We are working to ramp up testing sites. Uh, they have 17 community testing sites operating across the state. And if you want to know the, the nearest site uh, so that you can go be tested, you can call 211 or you can visit ldh.la.gov for information on locations. Uh, yesterday, Dr. Burks encouraged uh, all the governors to talk about Labor Day a little bit in advance and remind folks that the last surge that we experienced here in Louisiana and much of the countries, particularly the Sun Belt, you can trace the surge in cases to the activity that occurred during Memorial Day, um, and which started the summer. Labor Day is the, the holiday that marks the end of summer. And so what we're trying to do is get in front of that holiday and remind people um, that, that uh, it's critically important that we not do things that are going to unnecessarily spread the virus, cause more people to contract it, and, and eventually cause more hospitalizations and deaths. Uh, so it's really important as we approach Labor Day weekend that people are mindful about the restrictions and mitigation measures that are in place, including wearing masks, uh, social distancing, six feet or more from people not in your same ha immediate household, washing your hands frequently, uh, staying home if you're sick, and reducing your activity to the maximum degree possible. It's also noteworthy that a large number of cases here and across the country are attributed to relatively informal and small gatherings like backyard barbecues and birthday parties and so forth. Um, many of the same types of activities that, that you would see on Labor Day. So we are asking people to be especially mindful of that and to uh, uh, make sure that they, they are not engaging in those activities and that when they do venture out, uh, they follow all the mitigation measures that we have in place. I do want to remind people that, because um, with the COVID pandemic and Hurricane Laura, we kind of lost sight of this, I suspect, uh, but the census will end on the 30th day of this month, on September the 30th. That's a month earlier than it was originally going to close out. Uh, and we now have people who were spread all about the state, tens of thousands from southwest Louisiana in particular. But this message is for everyone in Louisiana to please respond to fill out your, your form for the census. Again, that deadline is September the 30th. Um, and if you are displaced because of Hurricane Laura, the, the uh, address you put in as your place of residence is the pre-storm residence uh, where you were. Uh, you can do this by going to my2020census.gov. That's my2020census.gov. And the degree to which we participate and get everyone counted uh, is going to make a difference for the next 10 years uh, in many, many ways, uh, both as it relates to allocation of federal funding for various things, but also as it relates to redistricting, uh, our representation um, in Congress, there's just all sorts of things that, that are tied to the census. 
Um, I do want to remind everybody that you can go to hurricanelaura.la.gov in order to get information about the state's response and different um, uh, points of contact that you may need depending on what it is that you're trying to access. Um, and so if you've got questions about uh, the state's response or anything else, please go to hurricanelaura.la.gov. Uh, and you can also get updates from the governor's office by texting Laura to 67283. 67283. And in general, 211 is always a good resource, especially if you have a question to ask about the availability of certain resources, the location of different services, and, and uh, so forth. You always call 211. If you've got information about sheltering, in addition to calling 211, you can text LA Shelter to 898 211. And if you need to register for FEMA assistance, as I mentioned previously, please go to disasterassistance.gov. Okay, so with that, uh, I am going to take some questions if you have any questions. Sam? Yeah, I, the, so it, it, the shelter numbers ticked up again last night. That was the smallest increase we've had since since uh, the before the storm hit. Um, but it does it, it does relate uh, primarily to the availability of insurance, but also to individuals realizing that the condition of their home is, is such that it's just not safe, habitable, and secure. And of course, anytime you have uh, power outage to a home, there's a decent chance that the community water supply doesn't have uh, power either. Although uh, every day uh, we're making considerable progress in getting generators uh, to those locations or the, the power companies are restoring power to those, uh, those water systems. But we still have a number of them who are down. And as I've mentioned previously, a number of water systems are damaged. So it's not just the fact that they don't have power, they actually received considerable damage in the hurricane. So obviously what's driving people to the shelter is some combination of their home uh, not being safe, habitable, and secure, not having power, and not having water. And for many people in our shelters, it's going to be all three. Uh, but you're right to, to say that those numbers continued to increase yesterday, uh, but by a much smaller number than we had seen previously. Yes, ma'am. Well, for, I haven't been given an explanation for, for why the $500 is opposed to another amount. Um, what we want to do is make sure that people take advantage of all the resources that they qualify for uh, and trying to get them the information so that, so that they can complete their registrations uh, with FEMA and understand that if they are not in their home because, because they, the, of the storm and they have these extraordinary expenses, uh, that they do qualify, um, and and I really I can't tell you why 500 and not some additional amount. And look, people's lives are really upside down right now, and I'm never going to say that a certain benefit is enough uh, for them uh, to get them uh, back into where they need to be. And we understand that this is just a one-time upfront, uh, short-term assistance, but it w it would be important for those people who need it and can get it. And from that perspective, I'm, I'm happy that it's available, but we know a lot more needs to be done, which is why we continue to work to get all of the individual assistance that people uh, can take advantage of, and not just in the nine parishes that have been approved by FEMA, but in the additional 14 parishes that we have requested. And, and again, we, we hope that that will happen soon. And ultimately, we're not in control of the, of the decision uh, but we continue to give information. And look, it's a, it, there's no fixed formula for when IA is approved, but we know that it takes into consideration the concentration 
of damages, special populations. So do you have a lot of elderly, low to moderate income people in the area with the concentration of damage and the availability of insurance? So those are the, the big three, but there are other factors as well uh, that FEMA looks, looks at. And, and I, so I can't give a, a better answer uh, for that, but we're going to keep making our case uh, as best we can. And, and more and more information becomes available over time, which is why I think you've seen uh, FEMA go back and add some, some new parishes. Yes, sir. Well, we've done it because upon the recommendations of our public health officials here, but also data that we've been given from the federal government, the White House Coronavirus Task Force, and really specific recommendations from that task force, principally from Dr. Burks, uh, that, that bars with on-premises uh, consumption are extraordinarily conducive uh, venues for the spread of, of the coronavirus. Um, and that's been borne out by the uh, contact tracing efforts here as well, where, where uh, I think it was 25% of the uh, outbreaks and 26% of the cases, and I may have that backwards, but it's only 1%, go back to bars for on-premises consumption. And we do realize this, this visits a hardship on those particular businesses. Um, but we also know that uh, since Memorial Day, the spread of coronavirus here and across the, the, the Sun Belt in particular has been driven by people 18 to 29 years old. Uh, and and uh, we know that, that much of that happened in bars, again, from, from contact tracing. So what we've done is, is we've barred, uh, prevented on-premises consumption, but allowed for curbside pickup uh, for delivery, drive-through if they have that, but we also allow them to, to change uh, away from a bar and start operating as a restaurant if they are able. Not all of them can, but some of them have a kitchen. And if they'll do that, they can operate under the same rules as a restaurant uh, where the alcohol service is incidental to the food service and they have to get more than half of their income from the food service component of their business. So those are things that we're doing uh, to try to give them some ability uh, to, to stay open to make, oh, in addition to that, if they have uh, video poker machines, which some do, they can have up to three machines. Two of those three uh, can remain open, and they can have customers uh, inside for that as well. Another thing we're doing to try to give them some opportunity to have income. But it's, it's, about, it's about the spread of the virus and trying to make sure we, we minimize that, especially uh, when we uh, came uh, out of Memorial Day and just saw that, that second surge uh, driven by those 18 to 29 years old. Sure. So you continue to focus on spread among young people. You acknowledge that's where a lot of this goes on. The CDC just came out with new numbers just in the last week, and they're now acknowledging that only 6% of the people that died from COVID were, were only for COVID. All of this, it's late more we understand that it's older people, elderly people, that are other conditions, right? They are the ones who are at risk to die. Why has the focus remained to shut down the rest of it? I mean, the state, her bars, there's so many negatives that come from this. Why couldn't the focus have been, let's get the older at risk people to be locked down? That seems like it would have been a better solution. Why did you not allow it? Well, first of all, we have asked people who are vulnerable to, to stay um, home as much as possible, to reduce their travel, their activity, to minimize the possibility that they will contract the disease. We've said that from the beginning, and we continue to do that as well. And I don't think there's any doubt but that the, uh, the increase in cases among young people uh, did, in fact, get spread to older and more vulnerable people over time. I, I will tell you that I do not interpret the CDC um, information the way you did about the 6 percent. Uh, because, because there may be 6% of death certificates that only list COVID. 
but the others will list a condition or a cause of death uh, that, that they wouldn't have had but for the fact that they had COVID. Um, so I, I, I don't think you've interpreted the CDC guidance correctly. Yes, sir. Governor, top engineer tells me today that a number of these water facilities experiencing outages today did not have access to backup power prior to the storm, mm-hmm. which is a violation of their requirements. Uh, how does that happen, and what's being done to make sure that every water facility gets a generator before the next storm gets here? Well, you know, I can't tell you why a specific uh, water system didn't have an on-site generator. Um, I, I just can't. I can't. If we're working with them now to get them generators, and, and I will tell you, a number of them had generators. Uh, some of the generators failed at the very onset uh, of of the loss of power. Others failed over time, um, and so so it's not quite as simple as not having them in many many cases. Um, but but I can tell you, we're working extremely hard through the Corps of Engineers, through the National Guard. Uh, to deliver and, and connect uh, generators, uh, and then to make sure that they have the fuel necessary to keep those generators running. Uh, and if those generators experience uh, uh, problems, uh, then we are working to replace them as soon as possible as well. Um, but, you know, I, I'm just, I can't an- begin to answer the question about why a particular system might not have had a generator uh, to begin with. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Well, first of all, the, the privacy concerns are always uh, at issue. Uh, HIPAA precludes us from sharing information under certain circumstances. Early on, uh, when we didn't have many COVID cases across the state and we didn't have PPE, in order to preserve the, the PPE that we had and, and have it focused primarily upon, uh, I'm sorry, with, with uh, folks in our hospitals and so forth, we were providing information uh, to offices of emergency preparedness that they could share uh, with first responders. Um, now, uh, I don't have Dr. B.U. here with me. I do have Dr. Ken. Are you aware of where we are at right now currently with respect to that policy? In progress. Okay. So, so I know that we're looking at that policy to see whether current circumstances continue to warrant us uh, exchanging that information. And it's driven partly because of the HIPAA concerns, partly because of the fact that we've addressed the PPE issue, um, but also because we have so much community spread that really law enforcement should be treating everyone as if they have COVID. Um, well, and, and that's why we're reviewing the policy. But I don't, I don't have an announcement for you today, uh, but I know we are reviewing the policy, and, and, and uh, we'll, we'll get, get you some more information soon. Yes, sir. Okay, so th- what would I recommend to residents who are in those 14 parishes that have not been? Okay, so the question is what recommendations might I have for residents of the 14 parishes that were included in my request for a major disaster declaration but haven't yet uh, been approved by FEMA for individual assistance? Um, obviously, I'm going to uh, ask them to, to try to be patient. Um, we, even though they're not approved for individual assistance, we are uh, delivering assistance to those parishes. Uh, the National Guard is working in those parishes to distribute um, uh, food, water, ice, tarps. Uh, we're, we're asking uh, uh, other assistance to be made available there, uh, whether it's through nonprofits, the faith-based community. We're obviously continuing to, to deliver generators uh, to their critical facilities, whether they're nursing homes, hospitals, uh, water systems, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so, so we're working as hard as we can as a state, um, and, and we, are, we are hopeful uh, that FEMA will see what we saw, and that is that the damage is extensive enough, concentrated enough, that the populations 
or vulnerable enough um, and that the availability of insurance is, uh, is not uh, widely available, I should say, so that they would be approved. And we're going we're gonna to continue to advocate on their behalf. Uh, but I, I, I try not to promise more than I can deliver. And until FEMA approves, they're, they're not approved. Uh, and, and we're going to keep working it as hard as we can. Okay, Sam, and then we'll, we'll come back over here. Um, well, I, I can't say that I'm alarmed uh, for a couple of reasons. Obviously, I'm concerned. I would rather I would rather there be zero uh, cases. I don't think that that's that's uh, something that we should expect. However, uh, I don't know the total number of tests that were performed to yield the 182 uh, positive results that you're you're talking about. Um, and secondly, it would be very interesting for me to know how many of those cases are symptomatic or asymptomatic. Um, and so long as individuals are uh, properly isolating, uh, once they know they have the virus uh, and not continuing to engage in activities that might spread the virus to others, especially those who are most vulnerable, um, then, then I would be obviously less alarmed uh, and less concerned. But there's, there's always going to be concern around that. Um, but look, it is not going to be possible to resume uh, any activity. Uh, and, and when you have community spread of COVID the way we do and not have some additional transmission of the virus. Um, so I can't tell you that that number in and of itself shocks me but it's something we're going to keep um, our, our eye on very closely. I will tell you that testing remains critically important. One of the, one of the things about this past week, uh, as we prepared for and, and uh, responded to Hurricane Laura that concerns me the most, is that we did uh, stop much of our, our testing in the state of Louisiana, especially as it relates to our surge testing sites, our community testing sites, some of which were on our college campuses. Uh, but I'm gratified to tell you that as of yesterday, we stood back up um, uh, testing sites, including on some of our college campuses, and those remain open today. And I do want to encourage those students who can, um, because they're, they're on those campuses, to make sure that, that they are tested. Because that, and if they have a positive result, uh, that they then uh, properly isolate to, to minimize the spread. Yes, sir. Um, well, first of all, the, the number in New Orleans, the, the positivity percentage in New Orleans is the, the smallest uh, in the state. Uh, I think it's a little less than 5%. So that, that uh, has an awful lot to do with it. Secondly, um, we know that they put forth a plan. And, and by the way, you may have just made news to me, so because I, I haven't heard that the Saints have made any announcement like that, but but maybe they maybe they have. And you said for the second game or the third game, okay? Because I think they had already announced for the first two games they would have none. Um, and so uh, it, it's the mayor took an independent look at it with her team uh, from the the look that that I took, uh, and because of the protocols that they have in place. Uh, and the limitation on the percentage of occupancy and so forth, um, and, and the, the way that they're going to uh, try to enforce the mitigation measures and, and, and so forth, we, we felt comfortable uh, that they could do that. Now, understand that between now and then, depending on what happens with our tests, our cases, our hospitalizations and so forth, that any such decision is tentative, and they certainly understand that, uh, but they have to have uh, some target to drive their planning uh, and, and their actions going forward. And so, so it's based on that, on that 25%. Yes, sir. One more question, Sure. In the early going of this thing, deaths was the focus for any new repair decisions they want to make the deaths. But since mid-June, deaths have remained less than 50% of the peak. And they now the focus is testing, testing. This seems to be almost 
Why do you agree? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I reject the premise of the question. Whether or not we proceeded to a phase uh, was determined by the White House guidelines. Uh, and those are explicitly COVID-like illnesses that are reported to emergency rooms. Uh, they are cases, uh, both as a raw number and a, a percentage of tests administered, so the percent positivity. And then it deals with hospitalization and the ability to deliver care without resort, resorting to crisis care. So those have always been the main criteria that have determined our, our decisions about whether we move to the next phase. Uh, the deaths are a lagging indicator. Um, and I will tell you, I'm very troubled uh, here in, in Louisiana that we still report, as I think you said, a, a steady number of deaths on a daily basis that is, is higher than anything that I'm comfortable with. But that's obviously a lagging indicator uh, because nobody dies if they don't get the disease in the first place, uh, not from COVID anyway. Uh, and, and so, but we're, we're always going to base our decisions on the guidelines, and, and that's what we have told the people of Louisiana every time that we've made a decision, which, um, by the way, uh, about a week from now, we, we owe you a decision on what happens Friday after next. So, um, okay. Look, thank you all for coming out today. We really appreciate uh, your continued coverage. Uh, obviously, a lot going on in Louisiana. And I did want to conclude by saying something, and, and, uh, and I, I know I've heard it said, and, and I've, I've said it too in a way that I, I thought I was conveying a different message. Uh, it was never my intention to convey to anybody that the damage from Hurricane Laura was anything other than horrific, and it is catastrophic. And we have tens of thousands of our fellow Louisianans whose homes and or businesses have been damaged or destroyed. Um, their livelihoods have been impacted, um, and it's a very, very tough situation. It's every bit as bad and probably worse uh, than Hurricane Rita in the area that was struck. Uh, where, where we thought we caught a break was that the storm surge didn't come inland the way that they had forecasted, and so we, weren't, we didn't have homeowners uh, in many places who were fighting both the wind uh, damage and flood waters, and as a result of that, too, the death toll from the, the hurricane was not what we had been led to believe was most likely. So from that perspective only, uh, the, the flood waters and the death toll uh, did we think we caught a break, uh, but I never meant to convey that I thought that the damage uh, uh, across southwest Louisiana and really extending all the way uh, up to uh, Jackson Parish and, and Union Parish and, and Washita and so forth was anything other than very, very catastrophic. Uh, and and I, I'm aware of that. I've always been aware of that. So if I didn't articulate that appropriately, I apologize to, to anyone out there who, who thought that I was making light of the overall uh, situation. I, that's not what I thought. It's not what I meant. And so I'll apologize f uh, for that. But I am thankful. Uh, that, that more people were not killed as a direct result of the, the storm. And I'm certain that that would have happened had the storm surge 30 miles inland materialized uh, the way that it was forecasted. So that's what I intended. We will have another press conference uh, tomorrow, maybe? maybe or okay. So, so tomorrow it's my intention to travel back uh, to the Lake Charles region. On Thursday, I intend uh, to travel to uh, Beauregard and Vernon parishes for one visit and another visit uh, in Allen and Jefferson Davis. Uh, so the next two days, we're going to be traveling. We're going to be changing the times of the UCG meetings and potentially of our press availabilities, but we will certainly let you know uh, when that's going to happen. So thank you all. Uh, continue to uh, be good neighbors out there. Do it from six feet away while wearing a mask and washing your hands. Uh, and then let's lift one another up in prayer. God bless and thank you. And thank you, sir. Thank you. Travel carefully. <laughs> Tell that to the to the helicopter pilot.